Hello, dear friends. This is Bible teacher and Pastor Nam, the founder of Life International. It's such a joy and pleasure to be with you. I am so privileged and excited to be with this great woman of God, all the way from Port Harcourt, Ada, George, your Force Model Church. Pastor Esther Bell, please talk to our people. Introduce yourself, man. Hello. Thank you so much, sir. It's really my pleasure to be doing this with you. Yeah. My name is Pastor Esther. I'm from Port Harcourt City. Our church is located in Port Harcourt City, the Treasure Force Model Church. Amen. Praise God. It's, I've been looking forward to this. I, the Lord spoke to me about doing this some time ago. We've been trying to work on this and make this happen. We thank God for the privilege we have to do it and I give God praise. I trust it's going to be wonderful. I told my friends last night, I said that um, when there's so much, let me say, pressure against something, it's because God is up to something about that thing. And for a while, we're trying to get nice. this. And somehow we, we some our technology and time and everything, but amen. Praise God, we've got it together and we can proceed. Now, uh, can you just tell me a little bit about your church, your ministry, about what you guys are up to, what you guys do over there at Treasure Force? Okay, at Treasure Force Model Church, we are advancing the kingdom of God by all means possible to the ends of the earth. Amen. So we do believe that um, we should um, pursue the advance the kingdom of God through all the seven mountains, you know, um, education, media, government. Christians should be, you know, very much active in all Amen. the spheres of influence, advancing Amen. the kingdom of God. So that's what we do, basically the kingdom of God. Amen. It's all about the kingdom. Basically, kingdom now, kingdom of God, let's do it. Amen. Raising up kingdom citizens who are going to possess the earth uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, of course, the grace of God, the yes. love of God, the power of God, everything is God. I mean, I love, I love kingdom teaching. I mean, I, I'm into kingdom teaching. I believe we're kingdom citizens and kingdom citizens speak kingdom language, operating kingdom love with kingdom authority and just do kingdom and basically take over and possess. Not take over in the sense of not mine, I'm taking what's not mine. No, but taking what belongs to us and just living this kingdom life naturally on the earth. Amen. Praise God. Now, we've been talking about something Amen. that uh, it, this has been on my heart to, sh to, to do. And like I said, it, it, we're, we're kind of waiting on the Lord on what direction to go. And the Lord just kind of led us in this direction. And I want to talk about it. We're going to be dealing with today overcoming shame and the past. Overcoming shame and the past. So we're going to start by just talking about what is shame. I want, I want, I want to hear from you. What is shame? Okay, so I think that shame is a feeling. Mm -hmm. I agree with the dictionary definition of shame as mm -hmm. a feeling because if um, I feel shame, you know, it's because something had happened that I felt was not, um, um, was not good for me, you know, mm -hmm. either humiliating to me or it was ridiculous and it would make other people look at me in a different way. So but the, the dictionary definition is that it's a painful is a painful feeling mm -hmm. of humiliation, excuse me, or distress, painful mm -hmm. feeling of, of humiliation or, or distress. And I like mm -hmm. to add that maybe sometimes it's ridiculous. Like, you know, you're in a situation where you, you felt like you were made a fool of, you know, yeah. and all you, it was just something that felt like I was, I was foolish. How could I have done something like this? You know, mm -hmm. I, you, you have regrets about mm -hmm. it. The consciousness of, of pain of, I'm sorry, of humiliation of being, made a fool of, of you having regrets that something happened. I think that's what shame is. Okay. So you're saying shame, it has two components to it. There's a, there's a personal component to it. That's there's there's the way I feel about it, number one. There's no, secondly, the other part is the, that leads to social isolation, humiliation, withdrawal, or inability to function yes. at ultimate levels. So while there are two components, the Absolutely. first component is internal, that's my personal feeling, the second component yes. is how people actually treat me yes, as a result of, how, of what has happened. You know, like if there's been a scandal attached yes. to somebody, the person internally feels, let me say, ashamed of what they've done or what they've been through or the experience they've had. There's also the multiplier effect of other people to treat that person with further accentuates the, the shame, the feeling of shame. And there's many times a withdrawal. Shame leads to many times a withdrawal from, from society and all that. Now, we're talking about believers. 
talking about believers now. I mean, do you think could this actually be a problem for believers? Yes, actually, I think it's a great deal is a problem for believers. You know, the, the different ways that people actually have this shame. For instance, the one that I know is common for young people is that because we have this, um, this thing of no sex before marriage, you now find that there are people who engage in masturbation as believers. But because of, nobody even knows that they're doing it, but they always, I know that people that have this issue have a feeling of shame that actually leads to self-condemnation. Mm. Now, they are not having sex. Yeah. You know, they are not doing any well. That in the sense of the word, they're like, they're not doing something that people would actually, people are actually seeing them. Yeah. However, they don't they themselves feel that shame. And mm. still, they feel like every other person is seeing them. I don't know how, how that works. You know, we kind of like, think, when we're feeling shame, we think that the way we see ourselves is how the whole world is seeing us as well. Mm. So we believe as yes, it's very, very, in fact, it's more with believers. Another example I could, I could give is that of, you know, people that, you know, the norm, the social norm as a believer is that no sex before marriage, you should get, you should be married, you know, and not divorced. But then if you're divorced, what now happens? You have that social stigma, stigma as well. You know, people mm -hmm. are you differently. You know, yeah. can you still work as a minister? What's, what's the next step? You know, everybody, in fact, every time is, is for me, for instance, personally, that's my experience. So every time it, they, they bring it back to me, even when I'm not having the feelings of shame. People ask me, are you not ashamed? <laughs> <laughs> are you serious? People ask you that? Yes, wow. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Just like um, yesterday, I had, um, I decided to wear, you know, my, um, my um, clergy yes. yeah, um, collar. Yeah. Yes. And wearing my clergy collar and taking a photograph with it, can you imagine that somebody actually told me that how can you wear a clergy collar and wear fake lashes. And actually, I don't have fake lashes, but I don't know how she looked at the picture. And she had to tell me, how can you do that? Have you no shame? No shame. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. So many times, even if you are not feeling ashamed, sometimes people, what people say, that stigma they put on you might even make you wonder, should I be ashamed? <laughs> and all that. Yes, you know. absolutely. <laughs> so absolutely. shame in essence can paralyze someone. Shame can paralyze yes. someone. And, and, yes. you know, now, we're going to take a break because we're going to come back to discuss how, what are the sources of shame? I know we've kind of touched on it, but I want to kind of dig in a little bit further. What are the sources of shame? You know, I want us to dig in, and I trust that our, those who are watching and who will watch will be blessed by this. This is Bible teacher Pastor Gandhi again of Father Love International with Pastor Esther of Treasure Force Bodo Church in Parak. Yes. We're talking about overcoming shame and the past. So, those back shortly. Hang in there, don't go, be blessed. Hello, dear friends. Once again, this Bible teacher, Pastor Nam, the founder of Life International, with Pastor Esther of uh, Treasure Force Bono Church in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. We're talking about overcoming shame and the past. Now, in our former segment, we began to talk about the, define what shame is. Let's go further into what is the past. What is the past? Pastor, 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 talk to us. Okay, what is the past? The past, um, because we're talking about shame, I want to um, assume that we're looking at a painful memory, you Good. know, um, something that has happened to you before that you haven't really let go of. You can Ooh. remember. Ooh, I like that. that comes. <laughs> yes, so it's a painful memory. You know, it's a painful memory. Usually I'll say that if you have been healed from um, a memory that, that's painful, actually you would not, no longer remember the pain. But as long as the pain is still in that memory, mm. then that's your past. That's what we were talking about dealing with right now. That's what mm -hmm. we want to, you know, um, put it alongside with shame and deal with it in this segment. So you're talking about what you're saying is this unresolved painful, unresolved painful, memories or experiences absolutely resolved yes you know that's what yes. basically is the past and we know that yes, uh, i tell people the past is what is past <laughs> you know so there's a reality of the past being passed behind you but if you've not dealt with the painful memories from the past as it were it can actually yes. hint, uh, hamper you in the present it can determine how you live your life it can determine how you function even in ministry 
in life, in your career, in your academics, in your whatever you're involved in. You know, and I believe uh, personally, I believe that there are many women, but more on the women's side, who are not married today, not because they have not had suitors around them, but sometimes because they've not resolved the past. And therefore, that becomes something that they bring in, you know, into their present. And it's like somebody who's thinking, who's brought a thinking past into the present that basically scares away everybody else in the present from dealing with them. That's right, sir. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about sources of shame. What are the sources that you can identify of, of shame? Okay, I think that basically all sources, the only source wants us to shame, and that's the enemy, right? Every other thing falls under this one. The enemy is the one who is the accuser of the brethren. That's every time you're feeling um, you have something that is unresolved or something that is making you feel shame, it's actually the enemy that keeps bringing it to your mind. It keeps bringing it to your memory and then makes it look as if it's real right now because it's unresolved. You know, there was a story of a school teacher that um, he's a school teacher now and re really like maybe in his um, almost fifties at this point now, but his teacher when he was in primary one had abused him and now he's almost 50 and he keeps talking about that his teacher. You would think that it happened yesterday. Wow. That means it's unresolved and it's right now in his present. You know, it's right now in the present. So who would bring such a thing? It's the enemy who is the accuser of the brethren. Because at that point, he's talking, he's trying to blame his teacher. But you see, the point is that he feels inadequate. Mm. He feels like there's something wrong with him. And that, that's right. belief is hampering his moving to the next oh. level. So it has to be the enemy first. And the enemy could come in, you know, in different sources, maybe from people, using people to get at you, just like how I had a very good day yesterday. And then this very holy sister, I won't say she's not holy, and then she comes and tells me that you can you even <laughs> wear fake eyelashes. And I don't even have fake eyelashes. You know, the question I wanted to say to her was, I don't even have fake eyelashes. <laughs> you want to come and touch them? Go and hold them. Come and try. Only that thing that they <laughs> Yeah, so she just put a hamper on my whole day. Then I felt like, no, there's nothing wrong with her. It's the enemy that's yeah. trying to use her to get to me. I mean, you know, it's I so have funny. To, what is that so funny? I remember watching during we had we had our presidential election last year here in America. I remember watching our president right now on the debate, you know, while traveling. And someone said, Is your hair fake? Donald Trump said, No, come on, pull it. Do you mind actually pull it? <laughs> said, People think your hair is fake. Do you mind actually rub your hair? Said, Look at it, it's not fake. So I, I understand what you're saying. You know, like I said, the primary source of shame is the enemy. Uh, the enemy has done this. That's what the Bible says. It's the enemy. But there are different pathways it comes in. All this I've personally realized is that sometimes we make wrong choices. And those wrong choices have certain wrong consequences. And they end up creating shameful experiences. That's one of the pathways that the enemy uses. The choice that we have made for ourselves. Wrong choices, foolish choices, sinful choices, ignorant choices. You know, that's what, it, that's what happens. Sometimes it's not necessarily sinful, but it's just wrong. It's based on ignorance. I remember I've driven before and I was trying to turn into a lane and I turned into the oncoming traffic. <laughs> you know, I had to put it back out again. You know, that's, that's a form of stigma or shame that comes up because people are blowing their horn and giving you the look and some people are even, you know, flip the bird on you like you in America. All kinds of things like you because people are upset and that way you kind of feel like beaten down and feel little. That's what shame does. Shame belittles you. Shame cuts you down from your size down to this what you think, you know. And, and that sort of shame, I discovered, it's, 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 it's what other people. Now, I, the first one I said was about you, what you've done, what other people do yeah. around you that brings you yes. in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, man. Okay, so um, what other people do around you can also be a source of shame you know, to us. Um, we already gave an example of what happened to me mm. just yesterday, yeah. you know, but also it could also be from, you know, the way society, look, let me say this, let me give this example. I like that. Um, for, there's a, there's a young man who, who came to, ch to church and 
as at the time he came to church, he gave his life to Christ, received the Holy Spirit, he was doing well. But one day he said he wanted to see me. And now he, he's um, talking with me and he, this is what he's saying. He's saying that, you know, the level of Christianity where he is right now, and you know, that he doesn't know if he's going to be able to become great in the sense of being a, a great Christian because the believers around him have not done anything sinful in their lifetime. You know, like sinful. The reason it, 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 you know, he has people who are in his team who are boasting that they've never had sex before. Mm. You know, they've never done this before. They've never done that. And for him, he has killed a lot of people. You know, yeah. in fact, he even started telling some kind of stories about how, you know, he killed someone and brought out his intestines and things like that. And I asked him, I said, Are you trying to convince me that you're a bad person? Because at this point, you are, you are born again. You are uh, saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that will stop you from becoming mm. the greatest man of God ever. Come on now. So that's the thing, the, the attitude. I think a lot of believers, we have that kind of attitude. We try yeah. to have a holier than thou attitude, attitude. But usually, I'm not deceived because when somebody comes to you making you feel as if they are better than you, it's actually they're trying to belittle you so that they themselves can feel better about their own lives. That's yeah. what I've come to understand. Okay. So, so people can actually make you feel that way. You know, they boast and then they say all kinds of things. Or sometimes it's even directly at you and tell you you're not good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you're saying so, is so real. So the, the religious attitude about people, people have sometimes, they can try and impute that on you and make you have the standard that the Bible did not set. So there's no standard. That's right. Paul said, my past is like trash. My past is done. Whatever I was before Christ mm -hmm. means nothing. So look, I give up all that and they will crash. Whether it was a very moralistic past, it's done. Whether it was a colorful past full of sinful behavior, it's all done. The Bible says now, now we are in Christ. Now are we in Christ. We are of God, who, of, of Christ who is of God, made unto us wisdom, and we are redemption. So that's really what matters, where we are today, not what we were in the past. All things pass away, all things are new. So when people start trying to bring this to past and make it a present reality and try to make you feel bad about your past, I mean, you have to understand, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. The third form of, the third way people, um, um, uh, people are afraid by shame also is society. Sometimes societal uh, uh, standards or whatever it is, cultural expectations, culture, yeah, that, that's the word. Cultural expectations of you sometimes are unrealistic they're not practical because we're all individual a good example is you know in many of our cultures you would expect that okay when you reach a certain stage in life you should have built a certain house in the village or drive a certain type of car okay now because you don't fit that that narrative you don't you're not driving that car you don't build that house you can be if i'll say intimidated by those people and they try to put you in a shameful place where before you know what's happening, you don't travel again to go and visit your people because you're not driving the car, you have not met their expectations. What do you have to say about that, man? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> wow, that's actually um, you know, apt, you know, because I think this happened to me as well. Mm. I left Nigeria and you know, I was married, I was a missionary, I was doing well. Now I'm coming back, you know, without. You know, I was not married, I had kids, and God was calling me to actually do ministry. You know, I knew that society would not accept me. Of course, I was hiding. At that point, I was hiding. You mm -hmm. don't know how to start a new work. And I said, what? I was like, you want to expose me like to society right now? You know, so, but at, at that point, what I told God was this. I said, the onus is on you to prove that you called me because this is all of you, God. <laughs> it's all of you. Amen. All of you. So that, Amen. So that was what I that was what I did. I just left it for, and I had to. In fact, initially when we started our church, some people would not even take our flyers because they would ask, say, is this your pastor? They say yes. They say, it's a woman, and then they reject the flyer. Or they'll wow. say, is this your pastor? She's wearing red lipstick. And it's too fine. <laughs> yeah, somebody actually said that. I said, she's too fine. I don't know if he come. That was it. You know, so, um, but 
couldn't make me stop because I believe one thing. I had a deal with God and I told him, I am not going to try to prove to anyone that I am holy. I'm not going to try to prove to anyone because God saw that I was not the best person. He saw that I was divorced. He saw that I was broken. He saw that I was humiliated. He saw that I was alone with two kids and with no money and with nowhere mm. to stay. And he decided to call me. So the Amen. bonus is on him. And I said, Lord, this is all. And Amen. since then, I have stayed. I think that's what happens when society has that. Because you can't change societal standards. Neither yes, can you change the way people think. You only change yourself. Amen. So at the end of the day, we need to you know, take everything and put it laid on God. God, just do this for me. Like, bring that's me out of one. the system. Deliver me. We're, we're that's actually, the system. We're actually dealing with overcoming already. Now, there's one more source of shame. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back to that. And from there, we'll get into how to, how to actually get, how to overcome. And we might, we might, we might go into examples and scriptures so that way we can connect with that. Okay, so we'll be right by this Bible teacher, Pastor Nandi, Pastor of Love International, and Pastor Esther of Treasure Force Model Church. Hang in there, we'll be right back. Be blessed. Hold on. Yeah, hello, friends and Bible teacher, Pastor Nandi again uh, with Pastor Esther. We're talking about overcoming shame and the past. Uh, so we're going to deal with the third, uh, the, the third uh, source of shame. We said, well, first of all, we, we underline one thing. Every shame comes from the devil. We, we said that clearly. But there are different pathways that devil uses to come in. We make choices. Society sets standards that are reasonable. The third one is an attack of the enemy by himself where it's not your fault, yeah. it's not society, it's just Satan just yeah. focused on you. I mean, let me say this. I mean, this might, this might sound, some might not want to hear this, but just like how God, the eyes of the Lord run to and through the earth, that he wants to show himself strong on the behalf of those who love him, so also Satan's eyes run to and through the earth, trying to focus on people for different reasons, spotlight them and attack them. And what does the devil do is to mm-hmm. start bring shame on people. Just come at them and bring shame on them. You know, and, and there's lots of examples in scriptures to that effect. So we're going to deal with that. So we want to kind of also mention that. Now, now so how do we deal with shame? How do we overcome shame? What are the things that, I mean, step by step, I'm a process man. I'm a teacher of the word. I like process. Right? I, I, yes, I want results. I want the end results. Praise God. But I want process. And apart from process, I want the process that you and I can practice all the time. I personally don't believe, I'm not against ministers, I'm a minister. I'm not against ministers. But I believe that my job is to train you, that's train everybody, so you can take what, I, what I'm teaching you and apply it without me being present. If I'm present and have to supervise you and help you do it, my job is not complete. I like your like email address, by the way, DIY Salvation. <laughs> I like that. That's what I'm talking about. DIY. I want to teach you so you can DIY. You can take it and do it yourself. So until that is done, I believe my job is not complete. So let's talk about the process. How do I overcome sh- shame? I mean, let me, let, me, let me start. Let me just say this. Number one, I put here, you have to identify what the shame is. I believe that unless you identify a problem, you cannot resolve that problem. I'm not saying you have to magnify it, identify it. It's between identification and magnification. I believe you need to identify what that problem is. And also, I think that's number one. Go ahead, man. Okay, so identifying it is very, very important. And identifying what the problem is, is uh, for me, I remember that um, some time ago, this happened to me where... Um, I, I felt ashamed because of the particular issue. And at that point, I had to ask myself, why am I so downcast now? Amen. Why is it that I'm... And then I realized that it was not so much about the thing that I've done, because just like the person who, who is masturbating and um, nobody is seeing him, who there was no apparent... Um, you know, there was nobody who was causing the shame. Only he himself was, you know... <laughs> Uh, condemning himself and all of that, how my situation was. It was something that I felt like I was foolish. I didn't make it the right decision. I made a wrong choice. I made a wrong decision. And now I'm here. So at that point, the first step I had to understand was that, number one, this shame that I'm, I'm having now is a feeling. And it means that this feeling can go away. 
And that if the feeling goes away, I'll be able to make the problem clearer and I'll be able to deal with it. But first, I had to deal with the shame. Amen. And I recognize that first, a feeling. Mm -hmm. And feelings are fleeting. And That's they right. go away. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so then after I realized that it, it was the feeling, I also realized that it's a perspective. Yeah, that my feeling of shame, mm -hmm. yes, is a perspective. Is how I am seeing it. If I can mm -hmm. only shift my perspective, I yeah. probably not painful anymore. For That's instance, right. the testimony of the brother who felt like he had done so many bad things, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time he was killing those people, he was feeling it was justice because he was in a secret society and they had all these kind of you know things and they were doing killing for all kinds of reasons, all right? Yeah. But yeah. he beat that it was justice that he was doing. Mm -hmm. Now, after he's born again, he now he has changed his perspective. He okay. now knows that a human being is bad. Now he's feeling shame mm -hmm. about the situation. Yeah. Which means that he needs to change his perspective again to yeah, what? Amen. To God. Amen. That's right. That's what the right. Bible says about him now that he is born again. Amen. So the Amen. moment he changes his perspective, he will no longer you know, judge himself wrong, wrongfully or start, uh, continue feeling the, sh um, the shame. Paul said, so. Paul said, I have done no wrong to any man. Yeah, man. I, have not, I have not wronged any man. Just imagine Paul saying that. And you're like, is it not the same Paul that was killing Christians? Come on. How can you say that? Because he has changed. Perspective, that's right. How God sees him. So it's really about the cross. It's really about seeing the cross and seeing what Christ has done and being able to understand with Father. When Christ died on the cross, I died on the cross with him. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 that Jesus Christ despised the shame of the cross. So while Christ was on the cross, on the mission to save us, he had to intentionally reject the shame. Because in case people didn't know that Christ was naked on the cross. He was beaten, he was a Jewish man, he understood what the cross meant. He understood the, the social stigma of the cross. So Jesus Christ had to literally reject the shame of the cross. He had to take on the shame, but reject in the sense that it would not affect him because he knew his mission. So then it's important for you, like I said, for us to get perspective. We look at what the cross represents. The cross represents, you know, all my, uh, the Bible says all the, all the accusations that were, nailed, that were against me were nailed to the cross. You know, those who were contrary to me, there were, there were accusations that were against me were nailed to the cross. So when I look at the cross, I see the cross as the symbol of my past. The symbol of, of decisions are made, decisions of, of the social, social stigma, of the attack of the enemy, the cross basically took care of all of them. Okay. Now, there's one thing that I've noticed that many people try to avoid, and, and that's the word repent. The word repent is the word that many times would try to avoid. And I, and, I, and I personally believe that people need to understand the word repent a little because the word repent has to do with, a, like I said, a change of perspective. Omolog, it, 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 it means it, it, it's a, a looking again. They look like I have to look again. That's what repentance is. I tell people it's two words, re and pent. Pent is like a penthouse, the top of a building. So I've got to climb up again and look again. And when I look again, I have a different perspective. And that also makes me make different choices. Because like I said, if my shame was just a result of wrong choices, okay, if I don't have a different perspective, then I'll keep making the same mistakes again. And I'll keep, if I'll say, I'll go in this cycle of shame. But if I can have a different perspective, then here's what happens. I interrupt that cycle. Because now I'm able to make proper choices. And that's very important. Go ahead, man. That's right. That's right. I really, I really, really like that part concerning repentance. Repent, yeah. change your mind. Yeah. Change your perspective. That's yeah. really, I, was, yeah. I, I was really enjoying yeah. I, forgot I, had to say yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm just glad that lately, the Lord don't like to will repent. I mean, I, I teach, I teach love of God, I teach the grace of God, I teach faith, I teach everything. And I, I love, but when I hear the word repent, it sounds like a negative word. It's like a dirty word. No, repentance is not a dirty word. Repentance is simply, hey, I changed my mind based on information, based on this, and it would also be actually not about my own choices. And I believe that you need to, like, I believe you need to acknowledge, acknowledge. Hello, young man. This is my son. Come on. Hello, say hello. Say hi. Hi. 
Okay, you can go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think you need to I think you need to acknowledge when people have made have people have made wrong choices, and acknowledge it. I say, look, I I've I've made you know I, I, now it's a problem for many people because many people think that when you repent, you become sin conscious. I don't believe that. I I mean true repentance is this. This is what the word of God says, this I've been doing things before. Now I have gained the word of God perspective, so I believe that you need to work of vocally express yourself that father thank you because this is what your word says i've been doing this before i repent i change my mind thank you for your grace thank you for your mercy i'm empowered to do what's right now in jesus name amen i believe that's important so sometimes if shame was the result of wrong choice or wrong decision i believe it's necessary for someone to repent to realize take ownership i believe repentance also is taking ownership take ownership of my part in the issue. If it was indeed there was a part of the issue, take ownership of it and say, look, I'm sorry. You know. Yes. No. Go ahead. Then. True true repentance, like you say, is actually submission to the will of God. That's, That's what right. it is. Because you're changing your mind from what you did before, what you did, the, the decisions you made were the wrong choices. But now you're changing your mind to what Christ says concerning you. Amen. And Bible also says that when you are submissive to God, that the enemy will flee from you. Amen. And I think this much summarizes everything. You know, that when we change our mind, when we stay on what the Bible says concerning us. Because I think it's in Psalm that says that I was afflicted when I went astray. That's right. That's what it says. So as long as you can submit to the will of God, you can submit to what the word of God says, what the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has done. Yeah. And it's, I think many times the reason why we think that um, repentance is actually seeing consciousness is because we, we get to downplay the role of free moral agency. Right? <laughs> yes, we downplay the role of free moral agency. Every single person has to make a decision at every given point in time. If free yeah. moral agency not important, then all of us would have been saved by now. The That's whole right. world, because right for the whole world. But free moral agency is there. God can yeah. tell me to start the church, and I would say no, and there's yeah. nothing God can do about it. Amen. He's not going to let me. So the same way, I can be wallowing in shame for the next 20 years, and if I don't change my mind about it and stick to the way, you know, I will still be in that thing, just like the testimony of the man whose um, childhood his um, teacher, you know, abused him, and yeah. now he's almost 50, he has the same issue. Now, maybe yeah. it's possible that he didn't have anyone to teach him. It's possible he didn't have anyone to teach him, but we are hearing the teachings now. Amen. Now, after hearing this, it is your responsibility now to actually change your mind, to do something about it. This is the mm -hmm. reason why we teach why the Bible, uh, Bible study teachers are everywhere. There are pastors mm -hmm. that teach the word so that you will change your mind. And mm -hmm. it's a constant thing. Just do it once. Repetition is necessary. Over Absolutely. and over. Yeah. Over it becomes, and over it becomes a habit. Yes, it's, I, I, it's one of, I think, the Bible, there's a man called Rehab. I'm sorry. There's a lady called Rehab in the Bible. And if you, if you remember, if you, Rehab was a prostitute. She was a prostitute, mm -hmm. Rehab. And when the spies came, what did she say? She heard the word of the Lord. And she responded to it differently. She no longer saw herself as a prostitute anymore. She saw an opportunity That's to become part of the kingdom of God, Israel, at that, at that point in time. So she lined up with that, that information. She changed her behavior by changing her perspective of herself. I've been known as a prostitute. And that woman met Jesus at the well. Okay? She was arguing religion. Oh, we're going to worship on this mountain. You guys don't worship on that mountain. And she was going the religious route. And Christ was going to try to get to the heart of the matter. At the end of the day, she changed her perspective on Jesus and her behavior changed. She now went back to the city and said, come and see a man. Not five men. <laughs> come and see a man. And when the man heard that, I said, whoa, this is serious. If this woman can come and see a man, not five men, this was a serious guy. So we also see the story of Jephthah. Jephthah was a man who was born. That's a very, it's, I, I mean, it's first can go and start Judges to the level of uh, chapter 12. Jephthah was born into a family. He was born out of wedlock. His mother was a prostitute who was born to the family of this man. And as Jephthah grew up, his, his 
his brother and sister rejected him because he said, You can't share inheritance. They kicked him out. The Bible says that Jephthah went into a land, a country called Tob. The word Tob means good. Here was Jephthah thrown into this wasteland. And this wasteland, the name was Tob. That word means good. The Bible says that Jephthah gathered a bunch of worthless people. And Jephthah led a group of people. And Jephthah ended up becoming uh, the one through whom, through God, was able to restore Israel. And the one back was Jephthah. Another good example which I love is, the, is, the, is Bartimaeus. But people say blind Bartimaeus. I said, don't call him blind Bartimaeus. He's not blind anymore. He was blind. But you see, the word Bartimaeus means son of honor. Son of honor. Imagine somebody that is son of honor is blind and begging on the street. So the enemy turned his good name, son of honor, into this honor, an attack of the enemy, literally speaking. Born blind. That's an attack of Satan. And what happened? Jesus, he met Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. A different perspective. And with that perspective, he changed positions, he threw off his beggarly garments and ran towards Jesus and he got healed. So it's the same process. Now, there's one more thing I wanted to kind of uh, want to talk about, touch on. I want you to talk about this, and that is this. It, and that way to, to overcome uh, shame in the past is to ignore shame. Reject nicknames and rebuke the devil. I want you, mm. I want you to talk about that. To not yes, shame us, reject nicknames. All right. Um, the first way to ignore shame, shame us, of course, is that you have to focus on God. Amen. That's the way. Mm. I'm the second, the second one, you know, and that's what the example I can make of the one I told God that he has to prove my calling amen, because it's the one So you focus on him in spite of what other people say. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that you have to be because what people tell you, they are throwing seeds into, you know, your your life and all of that. Yeah. Now this mm -hmm. is what I'm saying that, you know, when you ask to one of us. As a controlling influence, the controlling influence of our mm -hmm. um, controlling of our lives, and where we are because of the control in our lives. So, with the people calling you like that, if you believe in what they say, you will begin to manifest it, yeah. right? And the third one is what I, I don't know if I remember it. Rebuke the devil. Rebuke the devil. Just say, Satan, come away from me. Yeah. Don't come against you in the name of Jesus. That's right. All right, because he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. That's who he is. That's his business. He's, he's, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I believe that's very important. And then some other thing also I saw, I will, another point that God put on my heart is uh, three more points we're done. Keep loving yourself and others. It's important. Because if you don't love yourself, and, and I don't mean self-love in sense of, of, of pride, but self-love in terms of appreciation of who I am. Of, you know, this is who I am. Thank God for what God has done in my life. This is who I am. I thank God for, what, for where I am today and where God is taking me. So loving oneself in that sense, I mean, that's critical, very, very important in this person of recognition. Because it's a process. And that's something I want to underscore. It's, it's, I believe in instantaneous miracles and and, and I, mean, I believe in them. I've seen it happen. I've seen instantaneous things happen. But for most people, things are in a process form. So if your deliverance, quote unquote, is not instantaneous, guess what? It's a process. Even for those who receive instantaneous deliver deliverance, this, the process still has to be done. Because if not, you're going to yes. come back to the same thing again and you're going to start the cycle all over again. So keep loving yourself and others. Stay in the love of God. You know. And also become an ambassador of no condemnation and rescue others. That's very important. I believe that when you reach out to other people, you also get benefited. You also get blessed. The way I put it is that a pipe that passes water will always be wet. If you are, if you are, if you are an ambassador of no condemnation, no shame, it's under the blood. If that's what you're teaching and encouraging other people, 